Hello, I'm Stephen Toop, Vice Chancellor of the University of Cambridge, and it is my privilege to welcome you to this Cambridge Conversation, the 10th in a series we've been running almost since the beginning of the pandemic last year. Following my conversation with Professors Tamsin Ford and David Rowich, there will be a question and answer session of around 20 minutes. You can submit a question then or at any time using the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. This event is being recorded and will be shared on our YouTube channel. Every parent knows the fear and helplessness that comes with watching over a sick child. A suffering child is far harder to bear than your own illness. In December 1812, the poet and Cambridge alumnus, William Wordsworth, and his wife lost their six-year-old son, Thomas, after a short illness. To his friend, Southey, William wrote, I dare not say in what state of mind I am. I loved the boy with the utmost love of which my soul is capable, and he is taken from me. Yet in the agony of my spirit in surrendering such a treasure, I feel a thousand times richer than if I had never possessed it. Oh, Southey, feel for me. Thomas Wordsworth had died of measles, a disease that is today preventable by vaccination. In the 21st century, no child need ever become sick with measles, let alone die from it. Yet there are still a great many childhood illnesses that we cannot diagnose, let alone treat. Here at Cambridge, we're doing our best to change that. Indeed, it could be said that the ultimate aim of our pediatric researchers is to do themselves out of a job, to find the cause of every childhood disease and render it preventable, or at least easily treatable. Cambridge researchers are working on every aspect of childhood health. They're using the access to growing genomic data pools and remarkable technology that can analyze and cross-match at speed to diagnose and find causes, enabling targeted treatment. They're examining the roots of both physical and mental illness and recognizing that the two do not develop separately. Our minds and bodies are entwined and healthcare must be too. We have some of the best pediatric researchers in the world here at Cambridge, and I'm delighted that it will not be long before we have a new children's hospital. I'm confident it will be the best such facility in the world. More than a hospital, it will be a unique center where patients may be treated and nurtured from gestation to adulthood and where mental and physical health care are fully integrated, where each child, every child, will be treated as a whole being. Children and their families are front and center at the design of the Cambridge Children's Hospital. At its heart, the hospital will also be a research facility, a place where our researchers will seek the origins of disease, personalize intervention, and work to prevent the development of illness altogether. A place where the university will train the specialist pediatricians of the future. Children throughout the world, their health, mental and physical, their lives and their happiness are at the heart of all that we do with the ultimate aim that we may reach a day when no parent should ever be forced to surrender their treasure to disease. Friends, it's my great pleasure to introduce our panelists today. First, Tamsin Ford, who is Professor of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at the University of Cambridge and the recently appointed head of her department. She's internationally renowned as a child psychiatric epidemiologist and focuses on how to promote mental health, prevent mental ill health, and respond effectively to children and young people who are currently struggling. Professor David Rowich has been our head of pediatrics since 2016. He's a neonatologist and neuroscientist whose laboratory investigates genetic factors that determine development and diversity of glial cells of the brain and the response to injury. 
Well, Tamsin and David, it's great to have you. We are, I hope, emerging from the greatest health crisis in our memory. The irony of the steps that we've taken to avoid uh, COVID is that we have, I think, by doing so, created another health crisis. Uh, we learn more and more each day. We know personally of the great stresses placed on all of us by lockdown and separation from normal life and, and from those that we love. So there has to have been a tremendous effect on children. Tamsin, how do you see the COVID crisis as having affected the mental health of children and young people? Well, I think it, it's essentially a perfect storm. I think the first thing to say is that children and young people are surprisingly resilient, um, but they have been notably absent from policy decisions really until the autumn of last year. And I think it will differentially affect young people. So really little children are turning up at school with language delays and social skills delays because we have small families and they might not have siblings to play with. They might be an only child. Um, and they, it's much harder for a primary school age child to access education online. So there will be an educational cost, a developmental cost, and then there is the mental health impact of um, trying to live a very unusual existence. That may well be compounded by the, parent, the pressure on parents who are doing their utmost to keep education going, but they're not trained teachers. I imagine there is a huge, much greater respect for teachers these days, but amongst those who've tried to step in for them. I hope so. I think it's important. Well, rightly so, I would think. Um, but I think there is a difference to, say, being like my two 19-year-old um, daughters who are studying for their universities, streaming videos, each in their own room, each with their own laptop, to maybe living in a crowded flat with several siblings and one device, or being somewhere where the Wi-Fi isn't up for it. I think we will see a heightening of inequalities. And then not everybody's home is a safe place. And the real worry is, and it's sort of trickling through now, those children who are particularly vulnerable because they're living in a household under financial or even food insecurity, where perhaps there's an adult with poor mental health or substance misuse or domestic violence, and they are disappearing. First of all, school is often a sanctuary for such children, but secondly, they're disappearing off professionals' radars, um, who therefore find it much harder to keep an eye on them. So I think we need to work hard to support our children, um, particularly those who are struggling at the moment to recover from the impact of these lockdowns. Thanks, Tamsin. David, you're working on long-term studies, I know, collecting data, testing the genomes of babies uh, who require critical care. How has that work been affected by the pandemic from a research perspective? Oh, I, um, Stephen, you know, the entire university has been profoundly impacted by COVID from undergraduates all through to research. But fortunately, on the Addenbrooke's Bio campus, our research has tried to stay as active as possible. We do take care of intensively ill children who really can benefit from our research. And one of those studies that we've been carrying out involves genome sequencing. We've now increased our cohort of children um, having genome sequencing to over 500, making it one of the largest in the world. And that provides opportunities for training, incorporating new PhD students, postdoctoral fellows, and recruiting junior faculty. So there's a real positive development, I think, in our academic program coordinated with, with the research that we're performing. Now, this research is also providing direct benefits to patients. So of these 500 that have had testing, over 170 have a diagnosis, which we can use to improve their care. And one of the things we've, we've observed in the first phase of the project is that many of the the genes can affect brain and mental health. And that will lead to phase two of the project where we're going to recruit a, a new cohort of 300 children and their families. This will be in partnership with Illumina, uh, a, a company which has sort of its, its roots in Cambridge research history. And we'll be now focusing more on brain and mental health problems, how we can better understand and treat them, working with colleagues like Professor uh, Tamsin Ford, to characterize the mental health impacts 
of, of genes and how we can perhaps get new insights and provide new treatments. So you, you've emphasized again something that I've focused on in my opening remarks, which is this, this integration of mental health, uh, brain, and physical health, if I may put it that way, and the fact that they're often so intertwined. Uh, and the Cambridge model for the new children's hospital is really uh, right from the beginning uh, to do everything possible to integrate the work on mental health, brain, and uh, physical ill health. Uh, Tamsin, I gather that you've actually had some experience working in, a, in an integrated system where mental health and physical health were really brought together. Tell us a bit about that and how it works. Well, I was really lucky, and as a very junior trainee psychiatrist, I really didn't realise quite how lucky I was. So this was out in the East End of London, which at the time had a four-year nurse training, so that um, mm -hmm. nurses emerged with both a mental health training qualification and a um, physical health qualification. And it meant that in this acute um, paediatric ward that was mainly treating children with um, broken bones or cancer or physical health conditions that on every shift there was at least one nurse with a mental health condition. The paediatricians and child psychiatrists had set up the wards together and every ward um, including the paediatric neonatal intensive care and um, the intensive care for older children had what was called a psychosocial ward round every week. So we didn't go around every single patient in the ward, but it was an opportunity for any member of the staff to bring a situation around a child or their family to discuss, to think about, should we intervene? And if so, did the mental health team need to get directly involved or did we need to signpost them to somebody outside the hospital? And um, there were play therapists as well during the day who worked with everybody. Um, we had um, a couple of mental health beds on that ward and they nearly always had children who had an eating disorder because for obvious reasons, the interface between physical and mental health is very strong there or children who had harmed themselves and were recovering from taking too many pills, but equally it meant you know, the mental health team could work with them. But sometimes we had children who were very hard to place elsewhere. There aren't many inpatient beds for very ill sort of under 12s. And I can remember a, a girl of 11 who had a schizophrenic episode. Both her parents had schizophrenia, but there wasn't an inpatient bed for her to go to. But because we had this really good integrated unit, she could be nursed and looked after on this acute general ward and I didn't realize how unusual it was at the time because I was you know very young very junior but it was an amazing experience and and something I hope that we can do and actually get do even better with the Cambridge Children Hospital. Tamsin's experience uh, obviously points the way in, in, in an exciting direction and uh, I've had the great pleasure of working uh, with David as he's been spearheading the creation of uh, the Cambridge Children's Hospital. David, tell me a little bit more about how you envision the integration of uh, mental and physical health care for children. Well, as a, as a pediatrician who takes care of children who are intensively ill, and see the stress that this can put on families. There's a tremendous benefit to incorporating psychological medicine and a psychiatric perspective in the care of the whole family. Now that applies to the child themselves who may be going through very traumatic episodes. Imagine a child who has a liver transplant um, who could have mental health vulnerability or a child with an eating disorder who is starved. And so there are medical complications and when you start to think in those terms, you would say, what's the ideal medical team to take care of those children? And, it, and the answer is, it should be an integrated team with both psychiatry and acute pediatrics working together. And Tamsin's told you how exciting that care model can be, but actually it's very rare to find that anywhere in the world. Um, and in where Cambridge Children's will be uh, uh, sort of new and innovative is that it will be the first hospital in the world that is purpose built for integration so that we are going to think about the, the rooms and the, and the community spaces in the hospitals such that it can care for the child holistically, whether they have a mental health 
problem primarily or physical health problem primarily, we, and we, we aim that the wards will almost be indistinguishable between physical and mental health. We want our staff to be upskilled. That, that means the nurses, that means the you know, junior doctors. Uh, we think it'll be a great training opportunity for our medical students to see what I would say is the future of pediatrics. And it sounds so intuitively clear that we need to take care of body and mind together, but actually it happens almost nowhere in the world. And that's where our commitment to this new healthcare model we think will be a global model. I must say, it sounds both utterly logical and really exciting at the same time. And I mean, your example of a transplant patient, a, a child waiting for a transplant, you can only imagine the kind of mental stress that someone's going through in those kinds of circumstances. And yet, you know, historically, we've had trouble destigmatizing mental health. We, it's tended to be something that you know, many societies, including this one, people don't talk a lot about historically. And I think now there is much greater recognition that we just have to not be afraid to admit and to treat mental illness. It's certainly an issue that's coming up all the time in the, the school sector and in universities. Uh, what happens, Tamsin, if we don't treat children properly when they have uh, these, these mental health challenges? Well, I think um, the first thing to say is we do have effective treatments. We need more of them and we need to be able to better target them. And what I would like to see is more prevention so that you know we, we protect those who are vulnerable from getting ill in the first place, as, as David mentioned. Um, but there is a, you know, children who have a mental health um, problem pay a very high developmental price because whilst you, your mind is full of anxiety, you know, if you just think of yourself going through a really stressful time, it is hard to concentrate and focus. And that means, you know, if you're in that kind of state for three, six months, that's half an academic year where maybe you haven't been on top of your game. Um, and that you carry through. The same with the, developmental of, uh, the development of social skills. Um, and physical health. So I think, you know, at times when children are changing really rapidly, and I think it's particularly in the mid-teens, which is the peak onset of poor mental health, um, it can have a huge impact. If you think about the kinds of decisions or events that happen to people, say, between the age of 15 and 19, you know, it can be the difference between going to university and having a successful career or not. Um, and we really have a duty to step up and support those who need it of any age. By, by middle age, according to Scandinavian registries and a, 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 you know, a cohort study in Dunedin in New Zealand, more adults by middle age have had a mental health condition at some point than haven't. And yet we kind of treat it as if it's rare or it never happens. I think it is gradually changing, but there's still a lot of work to do. And when you're talking about young people, you really are speaking of the potential for a tremendous loss of their own potential, which is really yeah. sad to contemplate. Uh, David, can genomic research help us here too? Uh, we talked about prevention, but what about prediction? Can we, can we predict and then potentially head it off at the past, so to speak? Um, well, I think, um, Stephen, the simple answer is no but that is the future of pediatrics. Um, this is where we would like to develop tools so that when a baby is born, we can much better predict um, the health risks that might be in store and then develop interventions that could prevent that risk from ever becoming a disease. And this would be a new paradigm of preventive medicine, which is very different than the reactive medicine, which is you go to your doctor when there's a problem. Um, the problem with that is that often that problem has a history. And if we could now trace the origins of that history, uh, we think we can intervene at an earlier time point and that, that those early interventions could be more effective. That's, a, that's, that's an example of how the research in the University of Cambridge is so important to our concept because we can draw on the rich biomedical science, physical sciences, chemistry, new tools, and cognitive and behavioral sciences to really start to understand what are those signs that maybe a disease is just at its inception in time that we could prevent? Uh, we think that the age range of zero to five is especially important for psychological development 
And so those will there'll be cohorts of children that will be studying to look for signs that they could be at risk for later mental health risks. But we would try to find them in time to intervene, developing resilience. So maybe those risks don't manifest as later disease. One of the things that's emerged, obviously, with COVID is uh, an exacerbation of all of the pressures on the healthcare system. Uh, they're, they're there all the time uh, in all healthcare systems, obviously, some more than others and different types of pressure. Uh, given those stresses, Tamsin, uh, what else can we be doing that would be helpful to children in particular uh, as we try to sort of create more framing around them for the support for mental health? Well, that's a really good question. And I do think we need to get smart about this. Um, you know, before the pandemic and before the impacts that we're picking up in our epidemiological um, work in relation to child mental health, child mental health services were really struggling to meet the level of need. And we're not suddenly going to be able to magically you know, quadruple the provision. So I think schools are a really good setting and are recognised in policy. Um, schools are where teachers and parents often go um, or friends, you know, disclose that a, a youngster is self-harming or may have an eating disorder. So we need to support our teachers not to be therapists, but to be better at identifying those who really need help and being able to adequately support those with more minor transient problems within the school system. I think we also need to um, sort issues like bullying. It, it is bad for your mental health to either be bullied or to be a bully, both in childhood and adulthood. It casts a long shadow. And actually there are many um, evidence-based programs that you know, teach children about conflict resolution, teach people not to be a bystander, that schools could and should um, um, implement. And, and, you know, bullying is probably our most tractable mental health mm. risk factor, actually. The other, th the other area that I think we really should be focusing more on is teaching young people and children to look after their mental health. So, you know, they have lessons at school about healthy eating, they have lessons about drugs and alcohol, but what about lessons in identifying what stresses you out and also what makes you feel better? Um, you know, eating and sleeping well is not only good for your physical health, it's good for your mental health. So I think there's lots of work we could do to help people manage their, their themselves a bit better too. I, I can't resist in adding that uh, yesterday we had a, a special half day long session of the University Council looking at exactly the same set of issues, but in relation to our students uh, mm. at Cambridge University, this question of how to help people identify, uh, provide support, but not turn, uh, you know, faculty members and others into mental health care practitioners and yet helping them identify and, and channel support is is crucial at, at this stage in, in uh, human development as well. Link this back though to the children's hospital if you would Tams and how how might the hospital help in sort of a more integrated care that extends across uh, different uh, institutions in society? Well, I think um, this is something um, that adolescent inpatient units, and we're very fortunate in Cambridge in having a children's inpatient unit, of which there are seven in the country. Um, this is something that they do well because young people tend to come into these hospitals for longer. So in our adolescent inpatient unit, the youngsters are often fallen behind because very few um, children and young people are admitted into hospital for their mental health. Most of the treatment is in the community. So when they do come in, their problems are very severe and multidimensional and they're in for a long time. The school provision in our adolescent inpatient unit is such that these children go out level with their peers. So they've caught up. Um, and I think one of the, the um, vision we have is not just integration between mental and physical health care, but integration between community and hospital. Mm -hmm. And that includes the school. So we want to make sure that the, the hospital school has 
really good provision that there is provision by the bedside for those that are too ill to get up and go to a school session but are well enough to do something because a little bit of normality you know keeping a normal structure as far as you can is really helpful for anyone whatever their their health condition and that you know we we provide a similar level of schooling for the children with the physical health problem where it, it's been less of a provision because most children are in and out very quickly, but actually it's still really useful. Um, say a child's had chemotherapy or um, has lot, missed a lot of school or has had a head injury, for example, it's really useful for the hospital school to be able to link with the community school and work together to not only try and help the child stay as close to their peers as they can, but also their reintegration into school once they leave. So I think it's a really important part of the work that we hope to be doing. I've mentioned a couple of times that research will be absolutely at the heart of the hospital. And I understand, David, that your own laboratories will be located in the hospital. Say a little bit about how that works and how research is integrated broadly within the uh, work of a children's hospital. Yes. Um, so I think, you know, part of this hospital is about breaking down silos. And one of the really exciting aspects will be a situation where we'll have patients, families, clinicians, and researchers all in the same building. And that is going to create a dialogue and appreciation for problems of patients that will really have impact for the researchers. That will help to set our research agenda and really tailor it to what we're hearing from our families who want to be heard and want their ideas about research to be incorporated. Um, and that's an exciting opportunity. Uh, we are in fact developing research programs based on problems that our own patients have that take, our, take, take the work into laboratories. And it's been very interesting to see how the basic scientists in the university respond to that personal connection and how we might be able to do research that can affect a particular individual. It sort of fits a, a direction of travel where increasingly our research will help us develop personalized care for patients. Uh, and of course, you can imagine that's a complicated, sophisticated issue, but it's perfectly tailored to the integration of research for Cambridge Children's Hospital. Also, we think our children, young people in the region are interested in research and we've had feedback that they wanna see the research. So it will also be exciting to see how the architects can create laboratories with, for example, glass walls, so that as you walk into the hospital, you will see research you know, taking place in real time, um, enhancing that dialogue. And our research will also be tailored to addressing the toughest challenges uh, facing children and young people, which includes the problems of genetic disease, infection and inflammation, perinatal and neonatal death, uh, pediatric cancer, mental health, diabetes and obesity. So our research is really tailored to optimally support um, the sickest children that will be coming to our hospital. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to come to uh, questions uh, from uh, the participants online uh, very shortly, but I, I just want to pursue one final element with you, David. We've been focusing a lot on the community and hospital integration and integration of mental health and physical health within the hospital. But of course, the research that's done at the Cambridge Children's Hospital, like so much research done at Cambridge, will have real international uh, impact. Uh, how does locating the research function within a hospital uh, aid uh, international collaboration? I think our research um, uh, unit within the hospital, the Cambridge Children's Research Institute, we see as a catalyst for conversations that will extend well beyond the walls of the hospital. That will, of course, start in Cambridge, but it must extend across the world. Uh, so we are in conversations with Boston Children's Hospital, Sick Kids Toronto, Great Ormond Street, um, Melbourne Children's Hospital and others who all have um, aligned interests when it comes to applying cutting edge tools like genomics to benefit um, children's healthcare. So we very much will network and um, be a part of, I think, leading research institutions around the world with common interests. I also think it's very important though that our research in Cambridge has impact in low and middle income countries and that we look to partner across the world to incorporate diversity in what we do and make sure that the lessons that we're learning in a developed country like the UK can apply 
to Africa, India, and around the world. Well, we're getting lots of questions, not surprisingly, uh, from a, an audience like this. Um, uh, I'll start uh, with a question about books. Uh, there's a, a question here about uh, the role that reading ha may have for children who are perhaps isolated uh, and affected by parental stress, I suppose, especially during the COVID crisis, but more generally. Uh, does reading to small children and having children read to themselves later in life, does that, does that have a, a, a clear beneficial effect, Tamsin? There are huge um, benefits from reading to children. Um, and I speak as an only child who was a bookworm. Um, you're never lonely when you have the company of a good book. Um, and it's still actually my favorite activity in, uh, on a holiday is to sit down with a novel and read it from beginning to end without getting up. Me too. Um, <laughs> it's, it's, you know, and it's wonderful as a parent to read with a child. It's a way of de-stressing. Um, and, um, you know, it's some fun time to, to have together. Uh, years ago, I was involved in an interesting study, which was a behavior program compared with a reading support program. So this was teaching parents or supporting parents to read with their child. And it did have one or two one session at the beginning, which was about not getting into battles around reading, and then both programs together. And actually the reading program, maybe because it wasn't all about behavior, had a bigger effect on behavior because maybe it was just bringing the parent and the child together. So it can be a way of relieving family stress. It's certainly not going to do any harm. And you know, it may not cure mental health problems, but it certainly will do children lots of good in other ways if they're reading independently. Um, but the important thing is to try and make it fun. It doesn't have to be the, class the classics, text online, the, you know, the internet, um, picture books or cartoon books. It's still reading, it's still text, it all counts and it will help their vocabulary and help their learning. Uh, our son uh, was not uh, naturally inclined to read in the way his older sister was. And uh, we were getting a little bit nervous just to pick up on your last point, uh, Tamsin. And so we actually got him started on something called Captain Underpants, which is not something I would necessarily ever want to read, uh, but it worked. And he uh, became a voracious reader, which is, which is terrific. Uh, David, uh, one of the participants is uh, noting research of which he or she's aware showing Showing that glial cells uh, can influence stress responses. And the question is, do those findings open a way for new integrated treatments preventing mental health disorders? Um, that, that's an excellent question. And I think um, it would be um, um, put, you know, pointing us in a, in a direction that we would need to sort of um, uh, look at further. The, the, the glial cells, just so people have a, a sense, um, there are many billions of cells in our brain and they do need to be held together and supported. And the glial cells will uh, provide nutrition and also provide importantly, the recycling of neurotransmitters, which allows for optimal um, function of the neurons. And the neurons are what we think of as the, the thinking cells or the cells that can communicate, that, that, that we use for communication. There's every reason to think that a dysfunction of a glial cell could have profound implications for neurological and mental health function. And there are in fact many examples of this that are now being reported. It takes um, a little bit of a different perspective. If you focus on one cell, you'll get answers in that one cell. My lab's always focused on the, the, um, the populace, the 90% the, the of the cells in the brain that are glia, but have had very little research relatively speaking. And yes, uh, there will undoubtedly be uh, mental health uh, implications. For example, in schizophrenia, glial cells are implicated for epilepsy. And we think there'll be many more examples like that that will result from further research insights. Great. Uh, we have a question from a primary school teacher who uh, not surprisingly completely agrees that teachers are in a good place to uh, pick up on anxiety and other issues and to try to at least begin uh, to address them. But uh, this person makes the very uh, strong point that if you're going to address those issues properly, probably we need better funding and support for schools to run necessary interventions. So the question for you is really, how do you address 
questions of funding alongside questions of policy. Tamsin? I totally agree. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're children's um, mental health um, services are a Cinderella service of the Cinderella service that is mental health services compared to physical health services. And yet, um, you know, mental health accounts for 16% of um, the burden of morbidity. Um, so it is a really important problem. And more importantly, of those who suffer with, their, with poor mental health in adulthood, mostly they've had their first onset um, by adolescence at the latest. So there is funding going into um, training um, a mental health lead for each school um, to have a role in identification. There are school-based mental health teams that are being um, trained, but the funding is too small and the, the vision is too limited. So I think they're wanting to get it to a third of the country um, by 2022. Um, what about the other two thirds? You know, it, I think we, we saw a money tree in terms of vaccines and COVID response. Um, children are the message that we send to a future that we won't see. And I think, you know, we need to look after them better. And for me, well, I would say that, wouldn't I? I'm a child psychiatrist. But I think putting in some more funding to support schools to carry out their, their duty of in loco parentis and to support the minor um, mental health problems and ensure prompt effective treatment because we have effective treatments for those that need it is an absolute priority. Thanks very much. Um, different type of question here, more about the children's hospital model that uh, you particularly described, uh, David. Uh, the question is, what is the range of professions that's going to be represented within the hospital? And uh, how do the different um, healthcare disciplines connect well together? I and mean, it is there work that has to be done to make that as effective as possible? Um, the, you know, the hospital, um, of course, will have medics. Um, but, but we rely on um, allied health professionals, and these will be nurses, psychologists, physiotherapists, dietitians. you know, there's a range of expertise that goes into the care of a child. Um, what I found to be very exciting as we started to talk about the Children's Hospital with our colleagues in the allied health professions is their interest also in research and how their interest in innovation can feed into new programs. So I'll just pick out one of my favorite examples that I hope we can deliver, which is using food as medicine. So with research dietitians, we can start to think about replacing insulin with vegetables. And it's, it might sound a bit trite, but actually, you know, many uh, conditions, uh, obesity and diabetes, um, maybe others will be, you know, addressed by relatively straightforward and non-medical approaches. We want to bring in those perspectives and we want to see, think also about how we can integrate that with teaching and provide a, a kind of a benefit to families. So imagine um, a, a ward where there's a kitchen that's a community kitchen or in a cafe where we can have celebrity or other chefs come in and teach families how to cook. Those are some of the great ideas that we're seeing come in from our allied health professionals that you can just see that they'll add so much to the environment. So it's, 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 it's the rich tapestry. It is, it is a and if we can, you know, bring these great ideas into our care plan, it's going to go well beyond what I, as a medic, could come up with. And so we're really excited to get that dialogue uh, going as part of our planning for the hospital. Maybe we could bring that uh, rather wonderful young soccer player in to uh, help with uh, some uh, food issues. He's been Absolutely. fabulous, uh, Marcus. Um, Tamson, uh, again, different type of question here. The model of integrated care that you and David have been describing, how might that apply to young people with neurological differences, say on the autism spectrum or with ADHD? Well, I think, um, you know, they are a group that we do see, particularly um, young people with autism spectrum spectrum who then develop comorbid mental health conditions um, and you know sadly through sometimes through lack of being able to access the appropriate support sort of presenting crisis 
that's sort of one route in. I think the, the idea is to have an environment that is personalised and responsive to um, people's needs. So if you are a child with an autism spectrum, being on a crowded ward in a busy social space might be quite hard for you. Um, but the idea is that children will have bedrooms with one of the things um, our very engaged um, children, young people and families um, groups are coming forward is would there be any way of, of personalising bedrooms before people come in? Um, so I think it's about tailoring care to the needs of the child, whatever they are, and for the whole child, not for the condition that's actually prompted that an admission, but for all of their needs and playing also to all of their strengths in order to try and get them well and out of hospital as soon as possible. This is a question that probably both of you uh, will want to have something to say about. Um, the, the interlocutor is asking whether your view, your vision of this integrated service for children with mental health needs and physical needs, is that shared widely? by your peers is the question. And specifically, there's a, 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 a provision, of course, provisions in the Mental Health Act and whether or not people detained under the Mental Health Act or uh, under custody, whether they are going to get the same kind of integrated care that you're talking about. I'll start with you, David, and come to you, Tamsin. Um, thanks, um, Stephen. I'll give the American perspective. Um, as you can tell, I'm from California where um, there's a total silo uh, approach. Um, you, a psychiatrist could only come into the hospital if a child is having a acute psychotic or suicidal episode. They can't be integrated into the normal care of that child. It's a tremendous barrier to the model that we're developing in Cambridge. Um, and um, one of the really, I think, sort of exciting points of our journey was um, seeing how the NHS um, which of course provides universal health care to 60 million people, um, there, there was the possibility to start a new dialogue. And I think it was part, in part, the reimbursement system was, was just a bit more plastic and, and, and adaptable. Uh, and so that started a conversation with uh, our mental health colleagues, which really led to the generation of Cambridge Children's Hospital. And maybe Tamsin can say more uh, from the UK perspective about whether this is a um, a model that others are familiar with, I think it's really quite new. Tamsin. I think um, there is a lot of support and there is a lot of excitement and there are lots of really interesting conversations going on about how do we integrate. Um, and as you would expect, there are a range of views. So I think you know, there are some people who would want all care integrated, but actually there are, you know, pediatric um, psychiatric intensive care is not the same as pediatric physical health intensive care. And, you know, there are some things that just can't be integrated, but actually the co-location there is what's on offer. Um, so I think there will be areas of overlap and areas of specialism and coming to the specific issue around the Mental Health Act. Um, so the, the onus on care at the moment is for the least restrictive um, care possible. And um, sometimes even with children and young people, we do have to use the Mental Health um, Act. More rarely, um, children are sometimes um, required to stay in hospital using the Children's Act, but it's, if, you know, it's preferable for them to use the Mental Health Act because they have more rights under it. Um, but just because you have to stay in hospital because you're detained under the Mental Health Act does not mean that you lose all autonomy. And there are lots of decisions around your care that you can make. And there would be no difference in the access to the milieu on the ward, to the access to physical health doctors, um, physios, OTs, school, etc., as appropriate to that young person's care. Um, so, um, you know, we, we will have young people occasionally who are detained under the Mental Health Act, 
but that doesn't necessarily mean that they'll go off to somewhere else um, and they, they don't currently. I'm afraid we have time for only one more question and I'm sorry because there are lots of good ones here, but there's a whole range of questions. So I'm gonna pick this one because it, it uh, refers to two or three different questions. Uh, people are asking about uh, both the role of play uh, in the hospital and the role of uh, indoors, nature, outdoors. Uh, how is that being conceptualized in the design of the hospital? And, and how, do, how do we help children feel that they can play and should play? David. I'll start. I'll, I'll start, um, and maybe um, um, share that as we're as we're designing the hospital, we do want to bring in courtyards and outdoor spaces and and have that as part of the environment, and um, that we think is very beneficial. Now, um, our position on the Addenbrooke's Bio Campus looks out towards the Gog Magog, so we have a nice view, and that is something I think that will add to the environment. And I also want to mention how our colleagues from the engineering department and architecture have contributed ideas about sustainability um, that now have been incorporated into the NHS. And I think this hospital could be a model for the new sustainable buildings throughout the country um, with new building specs. And I'll only add that uh, we're very blessed at Cambridge to have uh, a Lego professor of play in the uh, Faculty of Education. And I know that Paul has uh, also been involved and integrated into the thinking around the design of the hospital and continue to work on that. It, it is absolutely, I think, uh, central uh, to the design of the hospital that it be a place that people are not, frankly, as much as possible afraid to be at and where there is outlet for the normal impulses and, and needed impulses of, of play and, and enjoyment. Well, unfortunately, we've uh, run out of time. I can tell that uh, Tamsin and David uh, could be uh, asked uh, hundreds more questions. And thank you so much for, uh, for engaging in the way you have. And thanks for really interesting questions. I'm sorry we couldn't answer them all. Uh, David and Tamsin, you've really given us, I think, a great glimpse into the future of children's health care, young people's health care, and the planned uh, children's hospital. Uh, I must say that for me, I'm going to take away a wonderful quotation from Tamsin, that children are a message to the future that we can't see. What a beautiful mm -hmm. idea. So please stay with us for a minute because we have a short video about the hospital narrated by our wonderful graduate Stephen Fry. And next week on Thursday, the 6th of May, we're going to have another thought-provoking Cambridge Conversations event with Professor David Runciman hosting a panel discussion on the future of democracy. I also hope that you can join us on the 18th of May when I will be joined by Melinda Gates and three outstanding Gates scholars for our second Gates Cambridge Scholarship event. We're gonna discuss ways to close the gender gap and eliminate poverty in a post-pandemic world. We're not there yet. So thank you for your engagement with Cambridge. And here is Stephen Fry presenting the Cambridge Children's Hospital. This is the very first of its kind. A new approach to healthcare. A new type of children's hospital. A hospital built from scratch, which understands the whole child, drawing on research into mind and body to treat mental and physical health together. Seeing a person, not just a patient, Taking care of them, not just their illness. Why should it stop a child playing, laughing? Why should it stop them staying with their friends and family? This is care that goes beyond hospital walls, stretching further into the community, closer to their favorite spot, to their front door. It's treatment that understands the child and the adult they'll become. This is a whole new way of thinking. Genomic research that personalizes medicine which will help young people feel better now and long into the future. A beacon of biomedical expertise in the heart of Cambridge 
that will transform how we treat illnesses in our region and positively impact children's health care the world over. Cambridge Children's Hospital. This is a whole new way. Thank you.